thanks for that uh, nice introduction. I hope I live up to it. Thank you for sharing uh, an hour of your evening tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk a bit about the culture at Facebook and how I think it fosters building innovative products, uh, even at scale. Before we get started, how many of you use Facebook? All right, how many of you don't use Facebook? Just a few, OK. It's OK. You can still, still go to the talk. Um, the, if you've used Facebook, I think you get the, the general idea and purpose of the product. Facebook really is a product that is there to help you connect with your friends and family, the people around you that you care about, the people around you that you love, and finding ways to, to learn more about them and to share more with them about what's going on in your life. And I think if you've used Facebook, you see that these interactions can vary from the extraordinarily profound to the extraordinarily mundane. And many of you, if you've used the product, have probably had a couple of those moments where you either met someone new through Facebook, or probably even more importantly, learn something about someone you already knew that, that really kind of changed your life. Uh, and one person was kind enough to share a story with me. Recently, I was, I was recruiting, and I was at a, just the booth at Facebook in a, in a conference, and a woman came up to me and she said, you know, I, I don't really want a job. I, I just want to tell you my story. She said, I lost my cat, it was my beloved pet, had run away, and I was really depressed on a Saturday night. So I decided just to post on Facebook and say, hey, I'm really sad I lost my cat. And her friends started to rally around this and started writing comments in and eventually organized a search party and posted ads in neighboring towns and actually found the cat and returned it to her home. And she just said, hey, I just want to thank you for, for you know, building a product that allowed me to, to do things like this. So I think Facebook is that product that allows people to connect and share. And I hope that those of you who have used the product have had that experience. So I'm just one part of Facebook. I'm one user on Facebook that has this experience, this immensely personalized experience. But what's amazing is how I am part and how each of you are part of this global network that is Facebook. And Facebook, in its just six years of operation, has grown tremendously. It's grown to almost or over half a billion users using the site on a regular basis. That's a good portion of the online population. And what's even more interesting than the number of people using Facebook is how much they use it. People don't tend to log in and just load one page. They're on it for almost 3 quarters of a trillion minutes a month online, the most visited property there on the internet. And probably even better than the amount of time they spend online is how interactive and how participatory this is. There are plenty of places you go where you're a passive consumer, you read what's there, but you don't actually participate in the conversation. In Facebook, there are tens of billions of pieces of content being generated by you and people like you every month. These are people sharing photos, status updates, location information, or commenting on other content that's out there. It's unbelievable, and an unbelievable kind of engagement rate for the users on the site. And this Facebook experience increasingly isn't just when you type www.facebook.com into your browser, but it's increasingly happening off of Facebook, where a couple of million now, a little over 2 million websites, have integrated some form of the Facebook platform on them. So you get that same sharing experience, the same personalized identity experience off of Facebook that you would on Facebook. And as I said, there's been this tremendous growth of Facebook over the uh, six years in its operation, from 0 million users to well over 500 million. And the whole premise of this talk was to explore the idea of how you innovate at scale and how you innovate at success. It's my premise that most companies and most projects, when they become successful, it actually becomes a break on innovation because that very success causes you to be much more risk averse and honestly just have more to lose when you're making changes. I think so far at Facebook, we've tried to actually accelerate the pace at which we develop products. And if you look at the timeline of products in the early years and the timeline of products just in the last six months, we're launching another one today, just about now as this talk is going on, there's been this huge increase in launching of new products and redoing all of the existing products while the company has grown, while the user base has grown, and the company has been very successful. So I wanted to explore today some of the reasons why I think Facebook is an increasingly innovative culture in spite of our own success. When thinking how to relate this to you, I uh, actually just turned to walking around our office. And these are signs from the walls in our office. Uh, I chose three of them. There are several more than three. But I think they're a good kind of cornerstone to this talk and a good kind of couple of things to explore in what we do. I think the very existence of these signs in our office is the first marker in, in the culture of Facebook and why it's innovative. These signs weren't something that a top-down executive management committee decided that these were the cultural aspects and then instructed someone to paint on the walls. These were something that an individual product designer 
one day decided to do during a hackathon and plaster all over the walls because it was his interpretation of the Facebook culture. And we kept it up there because we thought he got it pretty right. So there's three core concepts I want to talk about here. The first of which is fail harder. For any of you who are currently in university or have ever been in any educational setting, you know the word fail has very specific, unambiguously negative connotations in the academic context. There's nothing good about failing a class. There's no way to spin that positively. It's just a net negative thing. However, I think innovation, when you say innovation, true innovation, it means you're doing something no one else has done or you're taking a new cut on something someone else has already done. And I believe in order to do innovation, you have to do experimentation. And if you're doing true experimentation, you expect some of your experiments to fail because that's often where you learn the most. So my first premise is that building an innovative culture requires not avoiding failure, but embracing it and using it wherever you can. To give you a specific example of that, as I talked about, we've grown tremendously uh, over the last six years. And we knew in early 2008, we'd gotten pretty good at predicting how fast and how much Facebook was going to grow. We didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but we knew or were hoping that Facebook was going to grow 5 or 10x over the next two years. And that's great from a business side, but it's a challenge from building the systems that serve Facebook today. This means 5 or 10x the number of servers, 5 to 10x the amount of power. It means constructing larger and larger facilities to housing the compute resources in order to serve these, everyone, all of you, using Facebook every day. So we realized this problem early on. Facebook, uh, for those of you who are developers in the audience, Facebook is built on a language called PHP. Uh, it was originally hosted on a, on a PHP runtime, the thing that actually interprets the language and serves the pages to you. It's called the Zend Engine that was first built and deployed in 1999. So a very mature piece of technology used by millions of websites all around the world. I think PHP is one of the most popular languages to build websites out there. Um, and we were using this to run Facebook. And we said, look, we've got to figure out a way to make this runtime more efficient because it'll make it a lot cheaper for us to run and host a site in the future. And given a project of this scope, and how important it was to Facebook, we realized we couldn't just take a single solution, but we had to explore multiple in parallel. So we actually kicked off three separate parallel projects, one led by Ben, one led by Steve, and one led by Hai Ping. And these three projects were taking three fundamentally different approaches to building a more efficient runtime to host all of Facebook.com. And they were competing in the sense that we could only use one of them because they all did it in a different way. So by definition, when we set this up, two of these three projects were going to fail. The first project, which we called PHP Server, was what I call the least ambitious, the most incremental. We were 95% sure we could do it, but it had a theoretical ceiling of maybe 10 to 20% in terms of performance improvement. The next project, Quarkus, had a much higher possible theoretical footprint of improvement, but it was riskier in the sense that we were taking PHP code and hosting it on a Java runtime. However, we were leveraging an existing project out there that was both a commercial and open source project, so I thought the risk wasn't as great as doing something from scratch. The final project, HPHP, was by far the riskiest. This was basically building a brand new runtime from scratch, cross-compiling all of the PHP code into C++ and then running that. Uh, and there's a lot of difficulty in building a runtime at our scale that works and is correct. As we approach this project, and I think this is the first marker of what I mean by embracing failure, is all three teams knew about the other projects. This wasn't a secret Skunk Works project. They all knew what was happening. In fact, we asked them to get together on a regular basis and trade notes on what was happening. So this was more what I call friendly competition in the sense that everyone said, look, we want one of these things to work. That's what's right for Facebook. Let's let the best project win. So as time went on, we realized that both Quarkus and HPHP were looking fairly promising. They looked like they were going to work. So Ben decided to, to stop out and stop working on the PHP server project and work on something else. And I think that's the second lesson here, is that the team themselves took ownership over this decision and decided when to happen. There wasn't some executive decision to go in and shut these projects down. Ben said, hey, look, these look like they're working. I, I'm better off doing something else. As time went even further, we realized that the HP project was looking pretty likely, so Steve decided to shut down the Quarkus project and explore other things. So we've deployed HPHP in production right now. It's actually hosting all of Facebook.com and the Facebook platform as of early this year. It's uh, deployed performance improvements greater than 50% in terms of how efficient we are for using server resources. That translates into today's savings of tens of millions of dollars a year, and that will compound over the coming years as our infrastructure gets bigger and bigger. So this is a pretty dramatic success. It also, earlier this year, became an open source project that we call HipHop, 
uh, and this is mean that we've shared the code with the community, we've gotten tons of contributions back, and we now are helping other companies deploy this technology so that they too can reap the performance and efficiency benefits. This is the team celebrating the, uh, the launch of uh, HPHP. Um, and I, I think this is the last lesson from embracing failure, is the way in which we did this was try and set up some teams to go off and explore these problems and work together to figure out which one was the best. If you had asked me personally in, in middle of 2008 when we had a bunch of data on how these three were going, that I had to choose one of these three projects, I would have chosen Quarkus. I was personally worried at the time that the HPHP project was too risky, it was building something new from scratch, I think it's on the order of a couple hundred thousand lines of novel C++ code, and the chance that we would just be chasing random bugs that would crash or wouldn't be correct over a long period of time was really high. So I was personally excited about it, but worried about the risk. So if I had chosen back then, I would have made the wrong choice. And I think I'm pretty good at this. So I think the lesson here is you have to let people who have the data run, and you have to actually run experiments to make this work. So that's embracing failure, the first lesson, I think, in innovation. The second lesson I want to talk a little bit about is, is what we call at Facebook, move fast and break things. If you find a random Facebook engineer on the street and ask them to describe Facebook, I guarantee you that the words that probably first come out of their mouth are move fast. So I'm going to talk a bit what, about what I think move fast and break things means at Facebook. To me, it really boils down to empowering the individual to make a change. Those of us who work in software engineering and do engineering in general, maybe you're studying it now, I think one of the most fun and great motivators of engineering is it gives you the chance to make the change you want to see in the world. I can, by typing on the keyboard, build the software I want, make the changes in a site used by hundreds of millions of people. And we want to harness that energy, that creativity, that drive on a one-on-one -on -one basis for people who join us to be able to go and make positive changes to Facebook, the product, the infrastructure, and the technology. This starts on your first day and your first week of work. If you join us as an engineer in Facebook, everyone, regardless of your experience level, whether you just graduated from college or you're a 25-year vet, join a program we call Boot Camp. It's the first six weeks of engineering. The first thing we try and instill in you in terms of moving fast is that we expect within your first week of work, you've made a change to the live site. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but think about it for a second. Your first week of work, you're going to be making changes to a site used by 500 million people worldwide. That's our expectation of you and how we set expectations that we expect you to be making changes and making decisions quickly. Of course, there's senior engineers to help you in unit tests and all sorts of things to help make sure your changes are right. But the expectation from the very beginning is that you make contributions. But it doesn't just end in boot camp. After you choose your team in boot camp, there are lots of different ways in which you can contribute to Facebook. And I think that the most emblematic of our culture is the hackathon. Hackathon is a long-standing tradition at Facebook now that starts as a basically an all-night hack session. And here's uh, us getting organized with Pedram, one of our engineers, decided to organize this hackathon. This is uh, a bunch of people getting together in the, in the basement micro kitchen of Facebook, getting ready for this all-night event. Everyone gets together. You congregate around 7 or 8 o'clock. You get at night. You uh, get the logistics of the event and you kind of understand what the rules are, most importantly, when the food's coming. There's dinner at 10 and another snack at about 2 in the morning. But the other thing this does is it gets you a chance to meet other people and to talk about the projects you want to work on. So often you'll see people congregate and say, hey, I, I'd like to you know, do some experimentation to the I, Android app. Anyone else interested in working on that? And then what happens is, after you've done this kickoff and everyone's gotten together, people congregate in rooms or in areas around and just informal groups and start forming teams to hack on these projects. And this is what happens during the night. They hack, they get ready, they build their products. Around two or three in the morning, uh, the food comes. Sometimes we deliver to the office, sometimes our chefs stay up all night with us. Other times the, uh, the truck drives up and uh, this is actually from last Thursday when we had a, a university hackathon coming out. And I think the big question people ask me when I talk about hackathons is like, what the heck can you get done in 24 hours? Like, can you really build something real? And I think that there's two answers to that question. The first answer is, yeah, you can actually build lots of really interesting things real in 24 hours. The second is that the real purpose, in my mind, of a hackathon is to overcome the starter energy it takes to, to get a project going. Think about any big project in your life. Think about planning a trip, planning a wedding, building a software project, anything that's big and overwhelming. What's the hardest part? The hardest part is going from, I want to do this thing, to I haven't done a single thing on it yet, and I need to kind of overcome that. That idea of, I have a great idea of how to build a new feature for Facebook, but I'm not sure where to begin. 
The hackathon really is this constrained, intense environment where everyone's there, and it gives you that kind of boost, that starter energy to get over the hump and get your project rolling. So by the end of those 24 hours, you have something to show. It could be a very thin demo. It could be a mostly working prototype. And then by showing that prototype to everyone else in the company, you can figure out and get whether your idea is good or not. Most hackathon projects go nowhere. They're shown in a two or three minute lightning demo at the end, uh, and they, they go nowhere. Many hackathon projects have become releases in the site. Video was built this way. Actually, the project I talked to you about earlier today, HPHP, first started as a hackathon about three years ago, the very first version of that. Recently, the uh, Friends in Common page is a hackathon, and I wanted to show you something that uh, one of our interns from Waterloo uh, did at our most recent hackathon. This is a visualization. I actually asked him to, to change it. It was for the world, but we did Dublin. So this is actually Northern Ireland. Uh, these are check-ins over a one-day period uh, using Facebook Places in Northern Ireland. And then you'll see Dublin here in a second, visualizing where people are checking in over that time frame. So this is the sort of thing that you can do in a 24-hour period, or it could be something as, as fundamental as a brand new product on the site. And the cool thing is, once someone shows their product, the, often the feedback we get is like, that's really cool. What are you working on right now during the day? And then they explain it and we say, you should stop doing that and start working on your hackathon project. And that's how the thing gets into production. So hackathons really are about empowering the individual to get started, to overcome that starter energy, and to build something that could be the next great feature or the next great product from Facebook. So the last key part I want to talk about in terms of innovation is being afraid. I think this is actually one of the biggest blockers to innovation in successful companies. You think about it, you become very successful, you have a lot to lose, and you become afraid of change. So for Facebook, I think this is one of the things that both causes us a lot of difficulty and controversy, but is actually fundamental to what has become the success of Facebook. And to talk through this in, in kind of specific detail, I want to use the example of the Facebook platform. So I talked a bit about Facebook growth overall. The platform, Facebook platform, has been growing tremendously as well. A couple hundred million people use a platform on a regular basis. Half of the ComScore top 100 websites integrate the Facebook platform. This is the stat that blows my mind. 200 million people play games on the Facebook platform every month. That's more than the installed base of the Xbox, the PlayStation 3, and the Nintendo Wii combined. So platform is a huge, huge deal. Uh, probably 70%, most of the Facebook users, most of you have probably interacted with the platform in some time. And so this is the challenge. We launch platform, it's a big deal. There are thousands or millions of developers making hundreds to billions of dollars a year uh, building applications and building businesses on top of the Facebook platform. And when we first launched the Facebook platform, it was fairly unrestricted in what these applications could do. They could integrate fairly deeply into Facebook and do things like send you notifications. So the same way in which you got a notification that someone read on your wall, you could get a notification from a platform application that says maybe it's your turn to play a game. This is an actual animation of a, of a notifications widget for someone who works on the platform team. Um, just to give you a sense of, of what I'm about to talk about, which is the problem with this was because it was completely unrestricted, platform apps started to really pump a lot of notifications into that channel. That was a rational thing to do, because if they got more notifications, user would see them, they'd click on it, they go to their application, they get more usage. It's kind of the, you know, what's often referred to as the tragedy of the, of the commons. Every individual was incented to pump as much information in this notification channel as possible. As a result, the user experience became pretty horrid, because it was so packed with, with all these people competing that it just became useless. So I'd miss the fact that you had written on my wall you know, in between all of these other notifications from these applications. So we experimented with a bunch of different ways to try and throttle and make sure there was different policies for different applications, and it just didn't really work. So we took the hard decision was to basically completely eliminate access to the notification channel for applications. So we rolled this out not too long ago. So applications just can't use the notification channel anymore, and it's there purely for things that happen on Facebook. So these are real people, someone you know and you are friends with taking some action on Facebook. Now the reason this is an interesting example is this was really painful, and we knew this was going to be really hard on our developers, and this was something we did not relish at all. We knew it was going to cause people a lot of pain as they readjusted their business, but we had made the decision that the current course and speed was unsustainable over the long run that by being on the current path, that we're kind of a victim of our own success and a victim of the success of the platform, but that was a short-term win that was going to devalue the product over the long run and ruin it, we thought, for not just us, but all of our developers. So we decided to make this change, and we're able to do it even though we're at scale. I think the other example of platform that's really apropos here is a technical one. 
if any of you have built platform applications on Facebook, you know that that process had gotten increasingly complex and hard to deal with over time. So we first launched it in 2007 and made multiple iterations and changes over time. And each one of those changes added a little bit of complexity and maybe veered a little bit from the original design principles. So you had an API that became huge and hard to understand. So we faced another one of these success dilemmas is, you've got this problem, this platform used by hundreds of millions of people, but you really dislike the API. And you're just like, you know what? Knowing what we know now, we would do this very, very differently. So what do you do? We decided to launch this year, uh, earlier this year, basically a brand new API. We call it the Graph API, and it really is what we would envision the API if we had, could rebuild it knowing everything we know today in 2007. It's an API that allows you, with a web browser and a text editor, to become a Facebook developer. Simple for even non-technical people to understand in terms of how you can access the different data within Facebook and get, this is how you would get you know, if you wanted to build an application that was displaying my photos in a different way, or showed my groups, or showed my videos in a different way, you simply access it in a URL scheme that's very easy to understand, very easy for the end programmer to program. This requires us migrating all of our developers over to this new API. It requires us supporting both APIs for a short period of time as we do it. But again, it's worth the pain to get us to the place we want to be, rather than some place that happens to be working but isn't really ideal. And so that's what I mean by being not afraid, being willing to make changes even when they hurt in the short term because they help you in the long run. So I think that that's my at least 20 minute take on some aspects of the Facebook culture that cause us to be innovative. Embracing failure, empowering the individual, and being willing to make changes, especially when they hurt in the short term. So before I close and talk about questions, I wanted to talk a bit about you know, why innovation matters and why I care about this at all. Innovation matters I think, for Facebook, because we believe there's a change happening on the web and a change happening in the world, which is most websites, most technologies that are read-only and anonymous are becoming social and personalized, so that everything in the world that I want to do that's better with friends, you can do with Facebook. Think about it. Where do you ask for recommendations and where to go to dinner? You're going to take a trip next year. Where do you go? You're looking to buy a new stroller because you're having your first kid. What do you do? You often ask your friends. All of these activities from, uh, from in commerce to travel to gaming are all becoming more social. And we would like Facebook to be a big part of that transformation and a big player in that. And because I believe that all of these things, social games versus real games, are going to be very different, we can't just do what we're doing today. We have to build into our culture and the ability to adapt as it goes. So this is the last set of photos from the office, which really encapsulates, I think, the true spirit of Facebook, which is believing that what we're doing is effectively insignificant on the path to where we're going to be. And that every day we need to revisit what we've done and decide, knowing what we know now, could we do something different and better? And if so, let's go ahead and do that, because change is happening every day. So I think this is our slogan, is our journey is 1% finished. Much more to be done than is already done. So that's what I wanted to talk about. Hopefully that gave you an overview. We'll have lots of time for questions. If you guys have questions on this or other topics on Facebook, thanks again. Thanks, Mike. Um, we might just have a, a few questions before we um, open it up and, and take your questions as well. Um, we asked everybody to, uh, to submit questions online. We got a, a good few. Um, but I might kick off with, in your presentation, you talked about going from success to success to success and all the innovation that happens. And yes, fail harder. But um, is the game over in terms of, uh, of social networking? Some people say there's, there's room for niche, niche social networking sites elsewhere. But on that, on that scale there, it looks like Facebook has just completely obliterated any, any um, contenders. Is there, are we going to see a contender crop up, or is, is the game over? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, the slide is, is apropos. That it's my belief that the game is just beginning. So I think that you know, however that manifests, I think the version of Facebook that you see today and the products we see shipped today are not what you're going to see in a couple of years. And I think whenever that's, there's that kind of state change in the industry, there's plenty of room for new innovation, for disruption. It's something we think about uh, every day at Facebook, thinking about whether it's location-based products, whether it's different ways to communicate, using mobile and novel ways, integrating different services. I think there's a lot of room for innovation left in, kind of in this space. And I think we don't think we're anywhere near complete in what we're doing. So that would lead me to believe you know, if there was 
someone else who had a great idea and wanted to execute, there'd be plenty of room for them to do it. Okay, I guess that's, that's hopeful um, <laughs> for, for competitors in a way. Um, I might just ask you about um, one example, the, the translation crowdsourcing um, yeah. project that went on. Uh, somebody commented that said that was a huge success. Um, and I know Facebook, uh, I don't know if the, what the status of it is, but was trying to even patent that process. Um, can you tell us about the, the idea behind that and how that worked? So um, we actually have someone here in the audience from our language team who, uh, who may know this story better than I do. But um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, I wasn't actually there at the time, but from what I understand, um, the, it was really actually just necessity that got it done, which is like we couldn't actually afford to hire a huge team of people to go off and translate the website. And so we wanted to use the power of the people that was there on Facebook already in order to help us and uh, get it translated in, in multiple languages. And I think... You know, French was done in 24 hours by the community, and to this day, a large portion of our uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, a large portion of our uh, um, you know uh, translations are still done by community members. So um, I think if I got it correct, it was it was really just a like you know necessity is the mother of all invention. It's like we didn't have the capability to employ all the people to do it, and mm -hmm. so. We said, again, we don't have anything to lose. Let's try it. And it's worked out phenomenally well mm -hmm. and continues to work out. I mean, our, our, you know, we have a handful of people who are managing languages for, for the entire planet mm -hmm. and you know, building translations that are you know, as good or better than any other translations out there. Are there any other aspects of the site that you've used the same sort of model for that aren't not, not translation but yeah. other, other things? I think the most recent one, I think this was really clever, is um, if, if any of you have done mobile development, one of the challenges of developing for a mobile phone is there are about 4,500 different handsets you know, in use around the world, and most of them have slight differences in how they view and render web pages. Um, and these differences can mean the difference between your site working or not. Uh, and there is a set of open source libraries out there that, um, that try to do Bowser detection and figure out what features are enabled or not, but their database effectively was incomplete because there's so many phones and they're all over the, you know, maybe a different phone in Japan than it is in Korea, um, and they're updated all the time. So we did the same thing. We basically would show people, uh, you know, a web page and it would say, can you see this image? Yes, no. You know, and a couple asked them a couple of other questions and then they'd submit it. And we submit with it the information about the phone and the OS version and all the rest of it. And we built up a much better database that we're sharing with the community of you know, what features are enabled on which different phones. You know, the, the alternative is to hire a set of people and buy every phone on the market you know, and sit there and play with it. Yeah. Um, and this one gave us much better results much quicker. Okay. Um, tying in with green machines then um, and innovation, what, what kind of green, green innovation is going on at Facebook? Uh, maybe any examples of, of what you guys are doing? Yeah, well, we're, um, we're in the process of building. Uh, so, so, you know, the way most companies start when they build internet is they kind of, uh, you know, they lease space in a building in order to host their servers, or maybe they use a, a cloud-based service like S3. Um, and that's how Facebook started out. Uh, but we're at the scale now where we're building two of our own facilities, uh, one that's nearly complete in uh, Prineville, Oregon, and another that we're just getting started in, uh, in the county of Rutherford, North Carolina. And um, both of those data centers are using um, some uh, novel techniques we did to, uh, to improve the efficiency of cooling. It turns out a lot of the power you use in a data center, data centers are just big rooms filled with servers. And servers generate a lot of heat. And so a lot of the energy you end up uh, you know, expending is to actually cool the room so that the servers don't overheat and the disks don't fail. Um, so we've done some things by picking the right climate and whatnot so that we can use passive cooling in a lot of cases by cooling the data center without actually using air conditioning units, um, which is uh, much more efficient. Mm -hmm. So, And then the design of the physical servers themselves and uh, you know, the HPHP and HipHop, the software I showed, is itself a green project because you know, by improving the software, we're getting 50% you know, more out of each server we, we buy and run. Uh, and so that means we have to buy less servers to, to serve the same content. So I think both on the software side and on the physical infrastructure, everything from how you rack the servers to how you build interruptible power supplies to how you cool the building can have pretty dramatic impacts on the amount of power required per compute cycle mm -hmm. used. Okay. Um, and another question that we got online, um, I, I'll, I'll paraphrase it because it's, you probably deal with these kind of uh, responses all the time, but it was along the lines of, um, there's so many changes. Why don't they let us know about the changes? I don't like this change. You know, uh, it's kind of a, a user revolt when, yeah. when something comes out. I mean, that's been happening at Facebook forever. Um, but you talk about having you know, one, one streamlined sort of version of the site that everybody does. Because if you have a million preferences, you could turn this on, you could yep. turn that off. It gets very complicated. Um, is that just a reality people have to live with? Facebook is going to change, and you're, you're, you're with it or you're not? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the thing you alluded to there is, you know, the often response is, well, why don't you give me an option to kind of go back to the old one or configure this? And, and that works good once, but then you do that 10 or 12 times later and you end up with the, uh, you know, office preferences dialog that no one can understand because it's got 30 tabs in it um, when I'm just trying to figure out how to turn the thing I want on. So, um, so I think that products that are sim streamlined and simplified and have a minimum of options and sensible defaults tend to be the easiest to use. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't take these changes lightly, and we, we do uh, user test them quite a bit in, in, in the offices where we bring people in. We also um, test them uh, in small user groups before we roll it out to 100% of people on Facebook to look at how people are using the product and collect more feedback. So, um, you know, I think innovation, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it in this talk, the, the thing I would have added was, you know, that the, the comment that data doesn't lie, mm -hmm. is that I can have a great idea, and I can throw it out there on Facebook, and like it, I can see within a few weeks or maybe in a few days whether it's a good idea or not based on how people use it. You know, regardless of how much people are not complaining, we can see, are people using the site more or less? Are they using this feature more or less? And that's usually the best indicator that we either got something right or wrong. And the last thing I'll add is that um, you know, most people don't come to a site like Facebook to read an instruction manual. Yeah. So, um, so it's very difficult to explain by just like putting words everywhere and saying like, this is what the new thing does. So I think what we try and do is really um, build when we're building changes to the products, new products, really inline experiential to build the products so you understand them as you use them mm -hmm. and you understand the changes as they're happening rather than like sending you a huge instruction manual in terms mm -hmm. of what happens. And again, also doing things like providing better help and context and other things as we make those changes. But, um, you know, I think it really is motivated by building products that are better and perform better based on the data and then making sure people understand what those things, how they work by using them. And is that a different approach to, like, you know, the, the P word, privacy? Um, you know, is, is that because privacy on, on Facebook, there are a lot of ways to customize. Um, you know, you do have a lot of options. And some people say, you know, it's, it, I don't have enough options. Some people say it's too complicated. Yeah. Is, there, is there a conflict there with trying to keep the site simple and, and same for, for everyone without too many options? And then privacy, on the other hand, people kind of have an infinite um, preference in, in what they perceive as, as their optimum level of privacy. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think privacy is one area where we've actually tried to do both of these. So, uh, you know, earlier this year, we rolled out basically, you know, a simplified privacy setting that was a single screen that basically would override all of the other mm. settings and allow me to pick with literally two mouse clicks. It's like once I get to the page, do I want friends, friends of friends, or I want everyone, or do I want something custom? If I click one and hit OK, basically it, it presets all of my settings, mm -hmm. um, including actually retroactively. So if I you know, made a mistake in the past, I can kind of get it there. <laughs> and so that, you know, little details like that turned out to be a lot of engineering work, but we thought were very important to making sure that there was a safe way if someone just got their settings wrong and they could two clicks get it back to the right setting. And then you can go into custom mode where you still have all of the controls you used to have, which is, to my knowledge, the most detailed, nuanced um, set of privacy settings of any website, you know, any website of our kind out there, and allows you on a really individual content by content level to, to kind of get that right. But you touched on it. It's, it's, you know, you want to build something where the, you know, people understand what they can do, but for people who really care about the details, they can go into the details and modify it. Okay, and um, I might ask one more question before we open it up to the crowd. Um, somebody asked online, um, are there any plans to develop a Facebook browser? I might just change that around and say, are there any new Facebook sort of products being launched soon <laughs> um, that you can tell us a bit about or even uh, allude to perhaps? <laughs> yes, there are new things being launched soon, and, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately I can't tell you about them until they launch. Okay, So. all right. Um, well, we might, um, we've got a couple mics at the back, and we might open up if anybody has a question. Um, there, we got one down here. Just wait uh, until you grab the mic. Hey, um, nice presentation. Thank you very much. I was just wondering if you can share some numbers with us about the utilization of your servers in the data center, and if you have something like uh, peak hours that you normally experience on other websites, but since you're such a global website, if you, if you can notice something like this in Facebook as well or not. Yeah, um, I can't share the exact utilization numbers of our servers, and it does change over time. We do absolutely have a peak. Um, that, that peak uh, is usually um, you know, Mondays or Tuesday afternoons, depending on the week. What's interesting about the peak is, as you alluded to, um, as the Facebook has gotten more global, basically that the peak has flattened out, so it's becoming you know, wider and less, less steep. Uh, because the, the usage around the world kind of grows, and so you kind of get around around the clock uh, usage. We've also built um, a number of things that can um, 
kind of throttle up or throttle down based on demand. So we have a couple of you know, features on the site that would allow us to you know, do some things that are computationally more expensive uh, that we can do non-peak and then kind of turn them off at peak time if we need to to give ourselves more headroom you know, or if we're doing maintenance on a particular cluster or things like that. So you know, the challenge, though, is everything you're doing from a capacity planning standpoint really is building for that peak. And this is true of any web property out there. Is like you have to build to make sure you can survive that, that crunch period, otherwise it, it kind of doesn't matter. And so flattening out is actually good for us. And then other technologies which allow us to, to kind of programmatically flatten out the peak by turning some things off at the peak has is, is also been really helpful for us. Another question, we have one here and is there any back up there? Yeah, just this one. Hi there, um, I'm part of a research group doing a social network analysis. And um, there's a lot of people in academia um, trying to learn something from the social graphs and understand how to process them, doing problems like community yep. finding, link prediction, diffusion prediction. Um, I'm just curious, um, you guys obviously do a lot of this stuff internally. Could you give us any idea of um, what your state of the art is with respect to academia? Are you guys ahead of what's publicly available? Are you learning from it and engaging with it? Or what sort of stuff are you guys looking at and how's it rate? Yeah, um, it's, it's hard for me to do a snap assessment of whether you know, we're ahead or not. I think we do have you know, one advantage, which is you know, being able to look at the, the, the kind of data in real time in terms of what's happening. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's hard for me to assess that. I think that there are um, – the one area that I know a little bit more deeply, just because we are doing a lot of collaboration with uh, universities, is on systems research. Uh, that is an area where um, we just have environments that can't be replicated in a lab. And so we're doing a quite collaboration with uh, Stanford University and Berkeley and a few others on kind of next generation data centers. And they just like, they can't actually build a lab that's of the scale and of the production traffic in real time. So we've been actually working on with them to try and build some th synthetic uh, performance data sets and other things that they could use to try and simulate some of the behavior we're happening. And also working with them to actually kind of, you know, either open source some of the, the server technologies we've built uh, you know, or work on some collaboratively together. Because I think that, you know, I didn't get to talk about it in this talk, but the, the really interesting technical problem at Facebook is that every page that you view is completely customized to you. And the goal for us is to make every single pixel on that page relevant to you in some fashion based on you and your friends. And that means we're doing a, actually a tremendous amount of computation every time, you know, a page is loaded. And in particular, what's, what's hard is fetching a tremendously large amount of data. You know, if you look at a, a popular fan page like the uh, fan page, like the Starbucks fan page, it has north of 25 million fans, and they'll make a post, and you'll get 30 to 60,000 people liking that post, and then you'll see three or four of those posts on a page, and you go visit the Starbucks fan page, and we bother to go figure out whether one of your friends happens to be one of the 30 to 60,000 people that happen to comment on one of these six posts, and we do that computation at runtime because when you have that post and it says, you know, Alan and 30,000 other people commented on this, it's a better experience that you tend to you know, pay more attention to and it gives you signals as to what's important on this page. And so that requires a tremendous amount of fetching of data at runtime and, and a very difficult kind of network and, and database and caching design that, that builds an environment that you just really can't replicate in a lab. And so that I am pretty sure we are ahead of uh, many, res many universities and, and some of the systems we're actually building in production. Coming up there. How do, how do you compete against what Facebook wants to, um, to do in terms of making money versus what the user experience is? So just to give an example, you obviously compete against lots of different websites, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, whichever. So if you look at something like LinkedIn, where they focus a lot on companies recruiting talent, yep. Facebook could do that better, but it might be actually worse for the user if you did so. So how, how do you work out where the balance is? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so I think in the, um, in the last couple of years and, and to this date, there's been a pretty unabashed goal to concentrate on user experience over monetization. And the way I describe that is we do worry about monetization because we do want to fund the you know, R&D and the capital investment. You know, it it's, take, takes money to, to build data centers and to hire the best engineers on the planet so they can work on these systems problems. Um, so we want to have enough capital so we're not at all restricted in doing that. But we realize that you know, the incremental dollar in the bank, sitting in the bank, getting 0% you know, interest, is irrelevant compared to an increased user experience that brings more engagement and brings more people to the website. Uh, that has value over you know, tens of years to come versus that dollar that has none. So we've been trying to run the company at, at basically a balance point where we have just enough 
capital coming in to do everything we want from an R&D perspective, um, but any additional money we'd invest back into to user experience and growth. And you can see that in the, you know, if you look at just the count the pixels on the page that are dedicated to advertising on our homepage, and go visit any other site on the web, like any other site, and, and I think you'll actually see that there's actually less pixels on that page dedicated to advertising. And I think the second point there is, you know, in the limit, really well-honed personalized advertising is much more like a personal recommendation from a friend than it is an intrusive you know, video that pops over the page that interrupts you for 15 seconds while you're waiting for the thing you actually wanted to see. <laughs> like that's, that's a terrible user experience. But a, hey, you're in Dublin, here's a, you know, a dollar off the coffee shop around the corner if you'd like to get a coffee after the talk, that's pretty cool. That's actually something I'd want to see. And so I think that the, the long run vision for advertising in Facebook is that it is net additive to the user experience if done very well. And I think we're, we're starting to see some of the benefits of that and people actually engaging and liking the ads themselves as content. Great, we have a question in here and yeah, here. Um, I'm interested in your, your, your week one engineering. Can you describe um, maybe the, a notional path for a, a notional one like cone change going from a, an engineer who starts to it actually getting deployed on the site? So do they pair with the ops guys or how do you actually get to yeah. make your one line change and get it live? That's a great question. So, so uh, we uh, push changes to the website uh, every single day, um, sometimes multiple times a day. We try to do major changes, so if you're implementing a brand, you know, brand new feature or something that's more uh, fundamental to the system, um, you know, we typically try to do those on Tuesdays in one coordinated uh, push and do smaller pushes for the rest of the week. Um, and we push code that's application code on Tuesdays and we push changes to the runtime uh, on a different day so we can figure out you know, if there are issues with one versus the other. So as a new engineer, I'd write my code. Um, I get it running in my development server, and I test it out, make sure it's right, and then I'd submit it as a as a diff. There's a code review tool that you know allows you to see the changes you've made, and I can request that uh, a more senior engineer basically review that code. They review the code and give me feedback. Um, you know, may, usually there's some feedback that requires a change, in which case I make the changes and kind of repeat the cycle until the uh, experienced engineer has approved the diff basically and said that this is this is ready to go. Um, I would then uh, commit that change into our source control repository, uh, and it would um, either get picked up for the, for the next release, which is the most likely thing that would happen that next Tuesday, or if it was, you know, this wouldn't happen in the boot camp cast, click class, but if I was a, you know, a, a tenured engineer at Facebook, I would, had something more critical, I could, you know, request that that get merged into the next release and go out this day. Uh, and then uh, a series of tests, a series of automated tests get run uh, against those different builds and the results get proven. For the weekly tests, we also have a set of manual tests that happen and we um, basically sick the code on our own employees uh, for about two days um, to make sure there's no other issues and we get a lot of stuff kind of reported from that. Assuming all of that's a go, then on a, you know, on a Tuesday, uh, you have the person who wrote the code is expected to be online and available on an IRC channel where everyone else is. Um, because this isn't, um, you know, this is the other part of the culture. It's not a white glove service. This isn't something where it's like I write my code and then I like take off and like someone else deals with all the messy details of getting it onto production. Um, you're there to deal with the messy details because it's your code and if it broke something, we need you. Um, so you sit there, you know, during the push and, you know, there's a set of people who coordinate the actual rollout of this code because it's happening to a very large server infrastructure. And we do these things in increments to see if there's something wrong, you know, with the release to make sure that performance numbers and usage numbers are all what we want. And then eventually it makes its way out to, to all the different servers uh, you know, with the help of the release. release. If we're building a new feature, um, we typically actually separate the turning on of the feature from the deployment of the code. So usually what will happen is you'll get all the code out in production, and then we have a tool that allows us to nearly instantaneously turn features on and off for individual users or groups of users. And so you'll push the code out, make sure it's kind of lying in dark state, and then you maybe like flip it on for employees. And you can do this in a data-driven way, so we can turn it off right away if there's, there's some issue. And then you may do a test with you know, half a percent of people or with a particular population of users. And then if that's good, you kind of roll it all the way to 100. So it's pretty rare that you just like throw something on for 500 million people. Um, but it, you know, it can go, it does happen. Sometimes we have critical things that need to happen. Um, but often you'll go you know, from 0% from to 100% over some period of time, depending on how, how big or small the change is. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. And one right in front of you there. Thanks for the, pre 
thanks for the presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. So the innovation, is it the part only, is it the core value only of the product engineering in Facebook? Or like we, we all know that there are two main uh, organizations within the inter internet companies, engineering and sales. Is uh, innovation also a part of the sales organization? If you could, maybe it's not a, you're not the right person to ask, but still maybe you could give uh, like couple examples of the innovation in sales? Well, um, I'll give you this example, which is um, the hackathons are not open to just engineers. And we often have participation from many different groups um, that do different things. Because I think the, the real premise of a hackathon is kind of what I talked about earlier, which is you can make the change in the world you want to see. And you can do that through software. You can do that by influencing others. You can do that by picking up your hands and doing something physical. So in one of the hackathons, the legal team decided to redecorate our, our upper deck you know, and build a huge garden out there so that it was a nicer place to, to eat. Like, that's a great hackathon project. Um, you know, the signs on the, on that I used to do this presentation, that was a hackathon project. Um, the finance team decided to build a three-year plan in a hackathon. Um, so uh, <laughs> I thought that was awesome, but not as exciting. But so I think that there's... Um, but there's lots of participation. And actually what's cooler is, is just when people in engineering see the other teams there during the hackathon and like bump into the you know, chief of, of uh, the CFO or bump into the head of legal like in the truck line getting you know, snacks at 2 in the morning, that's awesome. Like that makes the engineers, makes me feel like I'm psyched to be here because it isn't just like we're the cool part of the company and doing all this cool stuff and the rest of these guys are nine to five. It really kind of infuses the rest of the culture. And I think we intend it to be an ethos that is not an engineering thing, but is a, is a company culture of make the change you want to see, make something happen. I think we have time for one or two more questions if we have any. Anybody want to get a last one in? There's one back there, yeah. And then, is there any over here? We've got a mic over here as well. I was just wondering if you could give us kind of a, just a rough overview of the kind of technology stack that you run on nowadays. So like uh, MySQL, Cassandra, Memcache, et cetera, just kind of top to bottom. Okay. Yeah, so, so the, um, I'll do it to top to bottom, and I won't, won't be able to go into full detail because there's just so much stuff to cover these days. But... Um, you know, the main website, you know, the thing that renders the web page and that is part of the application logic is, is written in PHP. Um, and so that's how you build the kind of templates for a page. And we've built um, a number now of kind of frameworks and abstractions in PHP to make that easier so you can kind of Lego block things together and have the, uh, you know, call into our JS stack and other things by default. If you're doing, you know, a common interaction on the website, you don't have to write, um, you know, new JavaScript for that. So we built frameworks in JavaScript and in PHP to make that easier. That PHP is kind of the main thing, and it runs throughout all of our data centers. So, you know, changes I make there happens everywhere um, and is run. And I think one of the reasons why Facebook has scaled is because all our features are hosted everywhere. So it isn't like you have one, one cluster that gets overheated um, and there's nowhere to spill it over to. Underneath PHP, kind of if I go all the way to the, to the bottom, the, the, the store of record, so the place where the definitive store of data happens, is, is MySQL. Uh, you know, there are now thousands of, of separate instances of MySQL. Uh, so it's a, it's a sharded database. So you are likely pinned to a different MySQL master server than I am. Um, it's by user. So you, each user gets bucketed to a different server. Those are the kind of core servers. And there's a series of replicated slaves that help for doing read queries. And then more important than that, on top of MySQL, there's a, a number of different caching systems uh, and query systems. The, the first of which was the introduction of memcache in... Uh, many years ago, and we've worked on a lot of work to scale memcache over the years and increase the performance by somewhere around three or four x. Uh, so memcache ends up serving a lot of the, when I talk about these huge data fetches, you have memcache. And then we've built an increasingly large array of um, specific systems dedicated towards particular verticals or particular classes of problems. So um, as, a, as a concrete example, when you go to your homepage, you know, we show you 30 stories on your homepage. And you have, you know, I have 850 friends-ish. So, you know, picking 30 stories out of a large cohort is actually a hard problem. So we built a custom back-end system called MultiFeed, um, which is a distributed system that uses an aggregation method, an aggregation node, and a set of leaf nodes to cache the, the full set of actions across the graph up to a certain date. And then you can query this thing and say, given this user, what are the top 30 stories I should show? 
and it gives back a series of story IDs that you can then go flush out and fetch the data from. So that is a completely novel kind of built-in system that we've built to, to serve out the home page. And there are more and more of those serving you know, different parts of how do I, that other example I gave you of you know, how do I query whether your friend has also liked this piece of content on a page is served by a different system. Um, the ad serving system to decide what ads to show you, um, you know, on every single page view. Um, you know, is, is a different backend system. So these are what I call custom distributed systems that are building more of the business logic and also taking on more of the distributed systems logic to you know, either do something new or do something at, at better scale or better efficiency. And so over time, those are becoming a larger portion of, of the product. Um, there are other storage systems in play besides MySQL. So MySQL is the, the storage of record for basic user data. Uh, photos and videos, so large files, are stored on a different system we've built called Haystack, which uses... Uh, commodity SATA hard drives, you know, you buy these 2U servers with uh, 12 drives in them, 12, one now to be two terabyte drives in them. Um, and then we uh, store them in a system that's able to serve them uh, directly off of this machine, so there's not a separate serving node, uh, at very high performance by basically being able to keep the index of all the photos in RAM. And so it doesn't ever have to look up metadata, it just knows exactly where to find it on the disk and serves it up. So if you upload a photo on Facebook today or upload a video on Facebook today, it's, it's replicated on uh, likely three of these Haystack nodes uh, separated across our data centers. And that is another efficiency in green project that was you know, two to three X more efficient than the system it, it, it replaced. Um, and then we use Cassandra for inbox search and uh, some new storage technologies that we've been working on for a variety of other things. And uh, I think the last, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'll be done in a second, <laughs> trying to do the, like, the 30 second of na name all the systems at Facebook. Um, we'll see if I get a, get a B plus on this. Um, the, uh, mo much of the data processing in ha at Facebook happens via Hadoop. So you know, there's a fairly large set of Hadoop clusters, which is how we process the data for reporting and other things like that. Um, and so that's a you know, separate system where we pull data off the production servers, put it into Hadoop, and then do some processing, which may then generate it and put it into a second system for doing analysis or, or dashboarding or other things like that. So I think I got most of the big bits, but there's you know, dozens of these, of these systems being built to, to serve specific needs. Was that what your question was? Was it something else? That, um, I say you, you covered it there. Um, was there one more question? I think we have time for one more here from, I thought I saw a hand over here. Yeah. I would just wait till you get the mic. I was just going to ask who you thought uh, Facebook's uh, main competitors are. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, main competitors. Well, you know, I think that it's hard to do anything on the internet these days without, um, uh, you know, worrying about Google because they're a, a big company out there and are very innovative in the products they build. I think in the um, in the long run, if you look at the history of technology companies, they're typically disrupted by the thing that they never thought of um, or the company they never thought to look at. Uh, and it's the, the new up-and-comer who is taking a different approach to the problem or sees a shift in the importance of the market. So, um, you know, uh, whether it be computing platform shifting, the shift to the web in the first place in the 90s, you know, disrupted a large series of companies. And this is why I think this move towards social is actually going to disrupt a large series of, of incumbent companies today that don't realize yet that there's going to be a small startup that will be the next way to listen to music or travel or shop online. Um, and so I think that that's the thing actually in aggregate that, that is the biggest risk for any company like Facebook that is, you know, a, a new series of companies better attuned to the changing market dynamics uh, takes you over, which is why, you know, my whole talk here and a lot of my emphasis when I go back to the office is just making sure that when we're focused on every day trying to understand what it is we should be building based on what we know today rather than what we just happened to do yesterday. I think uh, that's probably all we have time for. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Mike. And let's just give one big round of applause. Thanks. Thanks.